Yeah, I think in principle they could. Anyway, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, desktop OSs for Windows and Linux and their vulnerabilities. And Windows is, of course, uh, receives a lot more attention than Linux. Linux has its vulnerabilities, but Windows has been around a lot longer. Well, uh, Linux was around first, but Windows has a much larger parade of vulnerabilities um, because they went through their bad period before they took security seriously. So uh, earlier versions, Windows of uh, versions before 2002 when Bill Gates' trustworthy computing memo were deliberately written to be insecure as a company policy. They thought security was a waste of time and money. And you can see it was ridiculous. Um, their servers were getting hacked right and left. They would crash a lot and so on. Um, so the, original, the point of that was a business decision that when you buy a server, everything should already be on by default. So it's already a web server. All you have to do is put some files in it, and you'll see the web page. It's already a Telnet server and an FTP server and all that nonsense to make it easy to use. And they also thought you shouldn't have to read a book or go take a certification class to administer a Windows server because it's so easy to use. And in Windows, after um, 2002, they reversed company policy and decided to make everything secure by default, which means everything is turned off by default and you have to learn how to turn it back on. Um, and that applies ever since then, which is a less popular decision from the point of ease of use, but it's better for security, which Microsoft decided they cared more about. I think I'm turning off more of these lights. I think they're not contributing anything. Yeah. All right. So uh, this is kind of fun. If you go to the CVE list, you can see how many vulnerabilities there are, and it really is quite impressive. Uh, CVEMITRE.org. I think I put it here. Yeah, it's 8ZK, all right. Let's, let me find it. I didn't anticipate having so many links when I made this system, so I end up with nonsense like ZK. All right, so here's the CVE list, and you can search the master copy of the CVE list by keywords. And if you search for Windows, you find, in the fullness of time, 4,000 entries for vulnerabilities in Windows. Here's the ones in the year 2016. And they go on and on and on and on. Notice this is 5,152 so far this year. Now, not all of them apply to Windows, but a lot of them apply to Windows. I'm still in 2016. I'm still in 2016. There we are. I finally hit the end of it. So that's an awful lot of vulnerabilities. Um, and they're finding lots of them in one product or another. It's not all in the Windows operating system, but just a lot of things go wrong. Here's Adobe Flash Player having another bunch of them. Uh, on it goes. Anyway, so tons and tons of vulnerabilities, and this is why you'll never patch them all. They will never fix them all. You'll never know them all. You're just swimming through the soup. Yeah? Uh, what, well, that's a good question. They post, no. Well, typically what happened, you mean somebody found it, and reported it, and you can go to the CVE page and request a CVE number, then they verify it with like other researchers, then they give it a number. That just means they have verified that it is a real problem. It doesn't necessarily mean it's been patched, and in most of them, there is no public exploit. In a lot of them, some researcher just proved that in principle there's a weakness, and it gets passed before anybody actually figures out any way to exploit it. Um, and a lot of them, there's a private report, a vulnerability report of an exploit that goes only to the company, and the exploit never becomes public knowledge. <coughs> That's why if you take Metasploit, which we've been using, it has about 300 attacks. And here there's like 4,000. So only a small percentage of them actually become well enough known that people can just use them routinely. And those are the really dangerous ones. The uh, Department of Homeland Security issued an alert over MS-0867, a Microsoft 67 vulnerability in, in our product in Windows in year 2008 because that one was deadly. You could just take over any machine with no user interaction at all any time. And they said everybody has to pass their machine and put out a DHS alert. It's only every few years that one like that happens. Heartbleed was like that. It was just unbelievably dangerous. It was so easy to exploit that anybody could do it. And everybody had to, like, get up out of bed and go into work right now to fix this because it's really critical. Um, those only happen every couple of years. Um, however, if you are a server administrator, they happen much more often than that because there are exploits in the particular products you're using, like your database or your web server and you have to stay on top of that stuff. Anyway, um, which is why I was just talking to Vivek Ranchadrin about this, you know, the people have to really, this has to really be something you love if you're gonna work in security. Um, unless you wanna move over into legal and compliance, if you're in the part of it that is direct combat with the bad guys, it is, it has to be your passion because you often have to get up in the middle of the night and do something because something happened right now. And if you, if you don't really, if you want a nine to five job, 
Uh, this is not it. Unless you go over to legal and compliance, that's a nine to five job. But the, the exciting part of security, or direct combat with the bad guys, is not a nine to five job any more than being a cop is. Yeah? What kind of job requires you to do that? Uh, any job where you are directly in combat with the bad guys, and in particular being a server administrator, really does, because even letting aside all the security problems, servers keep going down, and you keep having to rush in to bring the server back up and fix the problems. It's like having a baby you're taking care of. You know, if you're sick, you have to drop everything and go take care of your poor server. Um, so the file system is one big issue on Windows. Um, the file system is your disk just stores a bunch of bits, and that's all it knows about. Hard disk controllers do not know what format they're using. They do not know when you've deleted a file. They just store bits in blocks of 512 bits at a time. Um, the operating system chooses to organize the disk in some way so it can define folders and files and keep track of them all. And so that's um, a fundamental disk format. Now Microsoft Windows has only used two different formats so far. Linux has dozens, maybe hundreds. Um, the original one was file allocation table. This dates from the time of floppy disks. Um, it just has a simple flat file. There is a record for each file and folder that only has so many bytes. I think it's 64 bytes for each one, and the file name can only be 8.3, eight letters before the dot and three letters after the dot. And there's only so much room for each file, and that's it. Each block has this entry, and that's what was used for very simple, very small storage media back in the time when disk drives were maybe 50 megabytes or 100 megabytes they used fat. And the most serious problem from a security point of view is that it doesn't support access control lists. So there is no way to stop anybody from accessing certain parts of your disk. You can't take a folder and say only the administrator can go in here, other people can't. If you have physical access to the floppy or the hard drive, you can read and write everything on the drive, and that's it. There is no facility for having an access control list on it. Um, that's because it was never intended to run in a multi-user environment. It was intended to run in an old MS-DOS machine where there's one user and that's it. Um, so NTFS was intended to be the business version of Windows, and they invented this system in 1993, and it has had various small upgrades since then, but none that really changed the base functionality much. NTFS, instead of having a fixed file allocation table, it has a thing called the master file table, which is a database that has records for each file and folder that can grow as necessary, so you can have a long list of who's allowed to get in the file and folder, and you can add it and change it. And so now you actually have control of who goes in which folder, and you can even turn on auditing and keep a record of who's gone in each folder. Um, so that's the grain here, and later on Microsoft added compression so you can shrink files a little bit, and journaling so that it records everything it does, so if the operating system crashes and you turn it back on later, it will usually be able to figure out where it left off and continue doing whatever it was doing, instead of just having to spend a half hour doing disk check and saying there are lost clusters found on the disk, which is what FAT did. Remember, this is the joy of Windows 98. Every time you get the blue screen of death, when you turn it back on, there's this slow progress bar, and it sweeps up all the leftover junk on the disk and puts it in files in the root of C called file 000, file 001, because it didn't have a memory, so if it was halfway through some kind of data transfer, it's lost, and now there's this data, it doesn't know where it came from, and it doesn't know what to do with it. Um, another thing they added was alternate data streams, a kind of bizarre feature added for compatibility with Apple. Not something Microsoft worries about too often. Um, but this is what it does, I'm not going to demonstrate it, but it's kind of fun. You can define a file, like up here, I echo a bunch of, okay, first I had created a file called foo, then I echo into foo colon bar. You take a file name and put a colon after it as if it was a drive letter and you can put files inside files. And if you do, it has some bizarre effects, the simplest one being foo still shows us six bytes. The dir shows the size of the command, this only shows the main stream. There's an alternate data stream down here with 31 bytes called foo bar colon dollars data. And if you do dir slash r, you see the alternate data stream. If you do a dir, you only see the primary data stream. So this was a place where viruses would hide for a while. Now modern antivirus products have gotten onto it. The purpose of this was for music. You could have a stream of music, and then you'd have another stream for like the copyright information, and another data stream for like the cover art and stuff. So you'd have many data streams coming from one file name. But it's supported by Windows. It's just kind of screwy. I'm not aware of very many people using it for any beneficial purpose, but it was a pretty cool place to hide things for a while until the antivirus companies wised up. Remote procedure call is a big issue in Windows, and for that matter in Linux, and it's responsible for most of the big Windows worms that spread from machine to machine because you have a process listening 
on a port, I think it's something like UDP 110, and you, it's offering many services on that port. And if you want to use Microsoft uh, services like Active Directory, you have to allow this. And a lot of those services have flaws. So there's a whole series of uh, worms that would infect one machine and then scan for open RPC ports and then infect the next machine and the next machine and spread around the world like Configure. Um, Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer can find these problems like many things can. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, and then there's Pass the Hash. This is one of the more hilarious Windows vulnerabilities. It's been around for years. Yeah, Microsoft has not stored passwords in plain text on the disk since I think Windows 95 or MS-DOS. There was something called a PWL file at one time, a password list, <laughs> but all modern versions of Windows store a hash, which in Microsoft's case was originally some hideous thing called the LM hash that was easy to break, and in modern versions of Windows they used the NTFS hash, which is one round of MD4, because it was designed in 1993 before MD5 was created. Uh, and never updated. So it's also incredibly easy to break, but it's slightly better than the earlier weak system. And the point is, when you authenticate over the network to access a file share on a server, you have to prove who you are. So you don't, you could send your password over the wire, but that would be too awful even for Microsoft. So they have a system where you hash the password and send a hash over the wire. Now the password can be retrieved from the hash under some conditions, but Microsoft has made that increasingly difficult. Now they use something called NTLM v2 that actually encrypts it with a secret key in addition to hashing it to make it hard to break into. But in practice, you don't have to. You can just record the traffic and send that same hash to another server and authenticate. So by stealing network traffic, you can just replay the network traffic, which is pretty rude. And that's called the pass the hash attack. If you get a Microsoft password hash, you typically do not have to crack it. You can just use it to authenticate to servers and get in supposedly secure accounts. And Microsoft, this has been going on for 15 or 20 years in Windows domains, and uh, hackers have been laughing at Microsoft, and Microsoft's defense has been that this is the only way they can implement single sign-on. Since you don't want to keep having to type your login for every server as you go through your company network, I'm getting my email, I'm getting this file, I'm contacting this other location, then they have to pass some kind of token around and someone could steal the token. So Microsoft's fix for this was not in changing the way they use hashes, but in making the hashes harder to get. And what they did was they created a new um, user group called Protected Users in a domain. And the idea is you will take your high privilege accounts like domain ad administrators and put them in this group. And then that account can only be used on the domain controller. The, the administrator cannot go to a workstation and log in as the domain administrator. They have to have another account for that. This has been Microsoft's best practice since Windows 2000, but they've never provided a way to enforce it technically until Windows Server 2012 R2 and Windows 8.1, I think, is where it came out. So if you're running the very latest version of Microsoft stuff, it is possible to configure this, and then the administrator cannot leave a high-value token on a risky workstation where someone is surfing the internet, and that's their plan to fix it. So they have been, they are aware of this, they've been trying to fix it. The main tool people use to attack it is Kerberos, uses in the projects to steal uh, Microsoft passwords. Um, uh, that's that the tool, the command is Kerberos, but the tool you're using is Mimikatch. Mimikatch is the hacking tool from uh, I think uh, a guy from New Zealand wrote it, named after a French comic strip. But anyway, it's very powerful, and this is his big thing, is breaking into Kerberos and doing the, breaking into these hashes, and every time Microsoft updates it, he immediately gets the tool and then goes and gives talks at DEF CON and stuff about how he can still hack into the latest one. One of the ones he did uh, a couple of years ago at DEF CON was show how to steal the golden ticket. In Kerberos, there's a normal ticket, which gives you the right to access one resource for 10 hours, but he's able to steal the golden ticket from a domain controller, and the golden ticket lets you write tickets to give you permission to access resources for 25 years. And he can steal that. So he really has messed up, you know, found the holes in Microsoft products over and over again. Anyway, so that's the game, now you're in silos. You have authentication policies, and now there are high-privileged accounts that are siloed, so they can only be used on certain computers and not on the computers you don't trust. And that's also called, the general principle is defense in depth. You have multiple layers of security, so that even if someone penetrates part of it, like a workstation where a normal employee is working and they click on a link and get it infected, they don't have permission on the domain controller yet because the domain control administrator cannot log in there and leave high-privileged tokens behind for the bad guy to steal. All right, so NetBIOS is um, software used for local area networks, um, and it's the way Microsoft does file and printer sharing on a local area network. Unfortunately, they're still using it, or TCP IP. Um, it's 
being deprecated slowly, but it's still used for legacy purposes on Windows. This is one of the big security problems of Windows in general. Apple doesn't do this. If you buy an Apple and Apple updates two versions, they abandon you. If you, don't, if you don't keep your stuff updated, they do not support you anymore and they don't care. And this is one of the many reasons why Apple's never made it into business. Because business people buy 10,000 machines, they fill the room with it, they don't want to hear just a few years later that that stuff is all obsolete and you have to buy new machines when it's still working. Microsoft is aware of that, so they always permit you to mix old stuff with new stuff, even very old stuff, even all the way back to MS-DOS with the latest version. And that's why they're always carrying along all these old legacy protocols because businesses really have machines that are 15 years old doing something, like running the cash register or the printer or something, that they're still using. And they are not willing to just upgrade everything, just for the convenience of Microsoft. So this server message block is what's used to share files on a local area network. Um, and it is used to pass credentials over the network if you want to get into a folder on a server and the folder is password protected so only certain users can get in and other users can't, then you have to pass credentials up to the server and that goes up there, um, pass, that means it passes a hash over the network and in the old days it was an LM hash back in the days of DOS and Windows 95 and such and that's what Loftcrack did, one of the big early hacking groups uh, really important in the industry um, and they made this product that would just steal Windows passwords off the network traffic. Um, and it also made an SMB relay product that would uh, hack into them, I think, using pass to hash or a similar attack. Yeah? So the network traffic was not encoded in any way? It was, it was hashed. It was hashed, but it was hashed with LN hashes, which take the password, break it up into two seven letter groups, turn all the lowercase to uppercase, and hash them separately. So it's a very low entropy system. Mm -hmm. That was what Microsoft used until Windows NT. So is this similar to, say, Having a website that has login but only uses HTTP? Um, it's not that bad. It's not plain text. It is in principle hashed, but it's hashed with such a miserable system that a modern machine, and even a machine 10 years ago, could do an entire brute force attack through the entire key space in about five minutes. So it was pretty bad. It was not quite as bad as plain text, but in practice, there were hacking tools that could pretty much reverse it in a short amount of time. Um, so Microsoft introduced SMB2, the upgrade in this, um, which was also to address a serious performance problem. Windows XP handled the window size for TCP transmissions so poorly that if you had a 100 megabit per second LAN and you dragged a file from one machine to another, it would only move at about 10% of the line speed because the, most of the bandwidth was wasted with useless overhead. SMB version 2 was intended to fix that. In Vista, it didn't work. In Vista, you would drag a file from here to there. It would then spend three or four minutes trying to figure out how to do it and then move the file. So a total amount of time is the same. But in Windows 7, they finally got it working. And if you have a Windows 7 on a local area network and move a file, it'll actually move at 90% of the line speed. You have a 100 megabit per second network, you'll get 90 megabits per second of real data moving, which is about as good as you can get. Anyway, um, when they introduced this, they rewrote their local area network stack and it created spectacular vulnerabilities. This guy, Laurent Gaffey, made a uh, fuzzer and he found two blue screen of death failures in Vista like two weeks apart. He, and his point, he hates Microsoft, he said, Microsoft says they have a secure software life cycle. They are just lying. They are bums. They don't do anything. All I did was run a fuzzer for five minutes and I found a blue screen of death. And then Microsoft apologized profusely and even published the source code to explain what error they made. And then he found another one the next week saying they're still bums. They still don't do fuzzing. This is what made Microsoft start fuzzing their stuff. See, now uh, a fuzzing is where you send random packets to a server to see if it'll crash. And Microsoft did not do that when they made Vista because they said this is a random process. We don't do sloppy things like that. We have a process of auditing source code and running it through programs that check for certain errors. And we know it's scientific. We know it's done. We're not going to do something random. But after Laurent Gaffey embarrassed them badly twice in a row, they switched to fuzzing their stuff. And, the, and one interesting thing is how simple this is. All he did was capture a packet in Wireshark. You run fuzzer, you just throw random packets at the server. Wait for it to die, then you go see which packet is the last one you sent. You just copy it out of Wireshark, and all you do is send that packet. Now, this is, in fact, the fuzzer that did it. So what he did was take a valid SMB packet to connect to a shared server, and then modify it by one bit. Say, flip this bit, flip this bit, flip this bit, flip this bit. Flip this bit. That's a simple fuzzer. Slightly altered packets. And if the code is sloppily written, one of those errors will cause it to crash. And that was certainly the case with Microsoft's code. And uh, like I say, Microsoft's quality seems to be still very bad. Now in Windows 10, they force you to take updates and they break things like crazy. Um, anyway, 
Um, so common internet file system was an attempt by Microsoft to improve SMB. They thought it was going to be used over the internet and such to share files. Uh, it, never, it never really caught on all that much. Um, had various enhancement features, but didn't really uh, become a product commonly used by businesses. Um, all right, Windows Server 2003 and later has a global catalog server that will find resources, sort of an enhancement of Active Directory. And domain controllers, you can spot them with Nmap very easily. They're always listing on a ton of ports, 135, 137, 139, usually 53, and it's 3268 for the global directory, uh, global catalog. There's just a lot of uh, ports. You'll see these characteristic ports. It's very easy to spot domain controllers, and every Windows network has to have a domain controller. If you don't have one, you've got a work group, and you have to maintain each machine separately, and this becomes unsupportable even with a small network as small as 10 machines. Within a year you will discover that you don't even know what accounts are on them, you don't know what software versions are on them. You really have to have a single point of administration to have any control over Windows networks. Um, the same thing is true of Apple, by the way, and what people tell me is companies that have Apples, you can't connect them to the domain controller, so they pay for another server called a Casper server, which runs in parallel to the domain controller. Because even if you have apples, you want to know that they're all, when they're connecting to the network, that their software is up to date, you might want to run antivirus on them. You still want a central point of administration to control them. For example, if you fire somebody, you want to delete their account on every machine, both the apples and the PCs, to make sure they're not coming back and logging in. And if you don't have a central point, you can't be sure that all those machines have received the new orders not to let Joe log in anymore. So anyway. Um, we talked about null sessions a couple chapters ago where you log in with a blank password and a blank username and now you have privileges to see things that you shouldn't be allowed to see, which is kind of nuts. Um, and that's one of the um, vulnerabilities that Microsoft has patched in the newer, more secure versions of Windows. And we talked about NetBIOS. You can uh, enumerate with many products to see it. Then there's Microsoft Web Servers. IIS is the Microsoft Web Server used by the Microsoft shops. In general, there's two kinds of businesses. There's open source businesses that use Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. And then there's the companies that use Windows domains, and therefore they use the Windows version of everything. The Windows Mail, the Winston Instant, Instant Messenger, the Windows Web Server, because it only works right if you use Microsoft everything. Then you can control it all from a Microsoft server. It is possible to control non-Microsoft software from your domain controller, but it is really painful. It's much easier to just force everyone to use the Microsoft version of everything, and that's mostly what people do. So they run IIS. Um, earlier versions, like versions 4 and 5, had a serious lot of vulnerabilities. Microsoft made a wizard you could run to um, update your old websites to make them more secure. People in the business told me that this thing is useless. What it does, it breaks your whole website so nothing works. What you really have to do, which they wanted to pretend you didn't, is you have to redesign your entire website to run on the new web server. This is very commonly the case, that it, to make something easy to use, you make it insecure, like log in as root everywhere, open all the permissions, then it's easier to do things, but it's not secure. Um, SQL Server is a real high value target because this has your database, and that's typically where you have credit card numbers and other good things that people want to steal, and Microsoft's product is MS SQL Server. And in the early versions of SQL Server, one of the many things they did to get hacked was the same thing your home routers typically do. They had, by default, it has an account with no password, the server administrator, SA. And by default, it has no password, so a large number of people never do put a password on it, and they're using servers connected to the internet with important data in them, and anybody can just log in. Um, so, that in modern, more modern versions, it will force you to put a password on that account, which is a lot better. Um, Make sure I'm in the right version here. We should be coming up to iClickers pretty soon. Yeah, we are. All right. So uh, buffer overflows is a common problem. A lot of Windows software had this problem. And Microsoft admitted when they wrote Service Pack 2 for Windows XP, they said, we are not supporting any early version of OS because back before Service Pack 2 for Windows XP, our programmers had never heard of buffer overflows and did not know it was something you should be avoiding. And from what I understand, if you take the programming classes here, you will also learn languages without learning what the common software vulnerabilities are, at least that's what people tell me. Um, this is standard in our business. We teach people to write bad code, and then we have another team of people trained to fix the bad code, and it's job security for all of us, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Anyway, so um, buffer overflows are where you define space for a certain number of bytes, and then you put more data in there than you expected. Higher, other languages will not let you do this. Python won't let you do this. Visual Basic won't let you do this. C will let you do it, and the consequences are disastrous. Um, and there were a whole series of those. Um, 
Microsoft fixed this recently and released their code about a year ago by changing um, library functions and changing global parameters to decrease your ability to use the dangerous functions like string copy that caused this. And uh, that's what they did, was patch C to make C a little slower and less dangerous, which is probably a good solution. And Mike, although this was the most common attack on Microsoft operating systems maybe uh, six, eight years ago, about four years ago, this stopped being so common because the defenses got strong enough that not too many of these slipped through anymore. Um, authentication is a famous weak spot in every network. People keep being able to log in as other people. Everybody knows this. Teenagers can usually guess each other's Facebook passwords and get in their account. And there's no end of ways to get in somebody else's account. Um, so people recommend these password policies. I left this in from your textbook kind of as an act of humor. Like he says, it requires six characters. Like, who are you kidding? Um, bad guys can now brute force at least up to 10 characters. And really, they've done past phrases up to like 50 characters now. Um, it's a lot of people are saying you just have to have two-factor authentication. A password alone, no matter how long or complex, is just not enough. You need to have a password plus a token or a mobile app or something. Um, anyway, uh, your domain controller has some attempts to enforce password security that are pretty weak. You can require password complexity, which means it must have uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols, at least three of those things. The idea here is to make it so your password is not in a dictionary, which would be fine if the only dictionaries available were like English dictionaries containing English words, but the fact is for the last seven or eight years, there have been enormously extensive dictionaries of stolen passwords from companies that got hacked. So we now have a dictionary of real passwords and everybody's password is in those lists and they're included in Kali Linux and they're just everywhere. So it's kind of hopeless to pretend that some kind of simple rule of forcing you to use punctuation marks is going to prevent your password from being in a dictionary. Um, um, effective is an account lockout threshold. So if someone starts guessing, if they guess wrong five times, you lock them out for whatever period of time you like, like forever until the administrator reactivates it, or maybe a half hour. Even a half hour after every five wrong guesses is enough to really slow down the attacker. So even if they have a list of a million passwords, they can't possibly try them all. That's much more effective than uh, pretending that you can come up with a simple mathematical solution to prevent your password being in that list. And of course, you want to get rid of the LM hashes. I don't think anybody... Uh, except embedded devices are still using the vulnerable versions of Windows which ended with Windows XP and Server 2003 that used the old IBM style of hashes that are incredibly easy to hack. Now they use the 1993 updated hashes of Windows NT which are slightly less horrible. And you do the password hacking hashes, you do the projects in this class and you'll see, I think you, um, when you do, the, when you crack Microsoft hashes, you use a dictionary of one million words and when you crack Linux hashes, you use a dictionary of 100 words. That's how different they are. Um, so here's the Linux password hashes, and some places the Microsoft password hashes down here someplace, I think. Yeah, here's the Windows hashes. So uh, in order to make the project not take too long, here you use, um, I think a dictionary, yeah, diary word list, 500 words is as much as you can try in Linux. But in Windows, you use, um, yeah, this is the ROCU list, which is 100 billion, but this is boiled down to only 500,000. It is much, much weaker. It's amazing. The, the Linux hashes have 5,000 rounds of SHA-512. The Microsoft hashes have one round of MD4. So it is pretty shocking. And what's really shocking is Microsoft has never updated it since 1993. Um, yeah? So even in Windows 10, it's still the same? No, it's never changed. And there's no salt either, so you can just, there are dictionaries online of password hashes, and they have worked since 1993, and they still work. On the domain controllers and everything, it is very strange that Microsoft never updated this. I put an article in 2600 Magazine screaming about it, and I got answers from Microsoft developers that, well, they added syskey encryption to protect it, but syskey encryption was also cracked 15 years ago. It's, Microsoft has some very strange blind spots about security. They're better than they used to be, but there's a bunch of things I think the problem is they got so used to lying. Uh, I gave a talk. <laughs> I gave a talk about Microsoft security at, at Pacific IT Pros about a year ago, and there were Microsoft experts around the time of this passed the hash mitigation. And I talked about how they hadn't updated the password hash, and the guy came later and said, I was going to interrupt you and tell you that's wrong. And I said, Boy, I wish you had, because we should have had that discussion. Because he believes their sales team that told them they updated it to NTLM v2, and they did, but they don't use it to store the hard disk password. They only use it on the network. So, but see, 
Microsoft has a fundamental problem with honesty. I mean, they will improve their product and then their sales team will amplify the power of their improvement by a factor of 10 until that becomes what people believe. It's, um, you know, this is like, I remember when, when um, Bill Gates was still at Microsoft, they said that everybody at Microsoft had uh, iPod to listen to their music, but the boy, you couldn't let the boss see that you had an iPod. You had to pretend to pull out a Zoom when the boss walked by because it would get really mad if you had an Apple device. And they said his wife and his teenage children wanted to have app iPhones, but he wouldn't let them have it. He made them use the Windows product. And this, you know, this is when you've forgotten that the point is to make a good product that people want. He said, no, we'll make a crappy product and force people to use it. And then we'll pretend we're successful. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, intellectual flaw when you have forgotten what it is to lie and you think ramming something down someone's throat is the same as making something people want. But that's where Microsoft has kind of always been. Anyway, um, got a few eye clicker questions. Come grab one if you need one. They used to have company songs like IBM. You'd go sing the company song and wear the company socks and they had a company hymnal and you would chant things to be hypnotized into their company cult group and Microsoft is still kind of that <coughs> way. This used to be an accepted <coughs> practice. It's, uh, it's kind of gone away in many places, but not at Microsoft. They did finally end forced ranking about a year ago though. Forced ranking was where they made each team of 10 have one of their members fired every three months. And this is unbelievably horrible for morale. This is what the, um, the Roman army did as the ultimate punishment for cowardice in battle. They make each squad kill one of their own men. It was greatly dreaded. After this, you're scarred for life. And Microsoft did this to their company every three months for years, and they finally knocked it off about a year ago. Yeah? So was it just round robin or a lot? No, they would they'd have performance reviews. Oh. And so what would happen is they would form conspiracies of old timers, and they would pick one person out of each 10 and carefully arrange for them to fail. So that would be the guy that gets killed. It's the only possible way to survive. So it led to bizarre things. Yeah? That's what they eventually decided and they ended it. But for years, it was their technique and there, were, there was a deep throat at Microsoft that published this stuff on Twitter for inside for like two years before they caught him and fired him, revealing all the internal secrets they didn't want you to know. And this is one of them. Everybody hates the company because of this forced ranking. Um, but however, I do sympathize working at a college with the idea that you have to get rid of the dead wood somehow. You certainly need some program of regularly firing the losers because otherwise you're stuck with them forever. But uh, a more logical program than this would probably be best. Yeah. Well, the thing with that is that if you don't have a proper program like that, then maybe you have some problems. But if you do it for a year, yeah. or two, or three, eventually, yeah. basically all of your government employees can be gone. At that point, you have to go on a witch hunt to find someone to get rid of. And yeah. it's only when you do it on a regular basis that it's bad. So uh, perhaps. Maybe but you, Maybe if it wasn't so forced, it wouldn't be so bad, but yeah. what they did so badly is that it was forced on a regular basis. And, and out of each group of 10, which is under misunderstanding statistics. I mean, you could have 10 geniuses, where, and this whole group of 10 should be fired, and none of this group of 10. It's kind of illegal, to, it's kind of mm -hmm. foolish to do it that way. Mm -hmm. But the general idea, I have to agree, that you have to have some system of getting rid of the old uh, people that aren't paying any attention. Not necessarily old ones, the ones that are not performing. This sounded more like a systematic culling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyway, so let's try some of these eye clicker things. Um, all right, where's the list of vulnerabilities? I'll quit at 30. That's common vulnerabilities and exposures, CVE. This is taxonomy. If you study the history of science, the first step in science is to just sort things into categories. Animals, vegetable, mineral, that's how you start. Give them names, and then you can start trying to figure out how they work. And that's what this is. So if five people write a report about some vulnerability, you can decide whether they're all talking about the same thing or not, because you gave it a name. Um, all right. So what's the old insecure Windows file system?
I'll quit at 25. Looks like the answers are in. And that's uh, FAT, the file allocation table. Good. All right. It'd be nice if NTFS was the old one. Microsoft has promised a new one over and over again and finally uh, abandoned it, called WinFS. They do have a new thing called ReFS, Resilient File System, but it's only for servers and it's intended to replace RAIDs. The main one used for operating systems is still NTFS. Anyway. It's a new technology. Yeah, it was new in 1993. Uh, so um, what's the mechanism for a computer to run code on a different computer? Which is, of course, just asking for abuse. Put it at 25. All right, that's remote procedure calls up there. And um, we talk about this quite a bit more in the malware analysis class. Uh, it turns out to lead to a lot of vulnerabilities because Microsoft makes it very easy to write code intended to run between two processes on the same box and then expose it through RPC to network use and internet use where you can take the same code that was never designed for that. And that's efficient, and you make money fast, but it leads to a lot of vulnerabilities. By the way, there's another thing which is hilarious. In Windows XP, they told us in Vista they were going to have a new feature where if your machine ran low on RAM, it would use machines, other RAM on other machines on your local area network. Because the network is 100 megabits per second, that's almost as fast as the internal bus. It would make your machine run faster. And I said, you've got to be kidding. And they never did that. It's like, I was thinking, from a security point of view, wow. This is awesome. The credit card numbers could just come from some other machine onto my machine and just be right there. This would be great. <laughs> but they didn't do it. What Apple did, which was much smarter, was they zipped RAM to make room when the RAM gets full. Mm -hmm. That's a much smarter solution, and Windows still doesn't do that. But I think they should. But they aren't asking for my opinion. Anyway, so. Um, How about XFAT? I mean, uh, oh, it's just a disk for me. Yeah, Microsoft never really else. supported it. Yeah, it's, it's, I know it's an option, but it, Microsoft never supported it for some reason. Oh. It's kind of useful for removable devices, though, because it works on the Mac as, and the it's PC. It's not secure and it's not as reliable sometimes, right? Uh, I don't really know. I've never used it much, but I do know it's a handy option for uh, removable devices. Um, it's this one, I think. All right, which one had no password at all? Which is kind of rude. Put it at 25. All right, that was the SQL Administrator account, the SA. All right. The SQL Server is true, but the more specific answer is SA account, because it's not the server that had no password. It's this particular account that had no password. Didn't all of those originally not have a password? What's that? Didn't all of those originally not have a password? No, I don't think so. No, SMB has to. It can only identify, it has to authenticate you somehow. Yeah. No, I think all the rest of them did. They all had, by the way, this is, oh, you asked that one. Good. All right. So now this one is the last one. All right. What defends you against past the hash attacks? Now, in Windows 98, Logging in was optional. That was entertaining. You could just cancel the login screen and get in. But that was not intended to be a security boundary. It was just intended to sort the email. Anyway, so um, this is silos. Is the new defense siloed accounts? They can only be used on certain machines, and therefore copies of the hash are not lying all over the place for the bad guys to steal. All right, let's take a break till 7.15, then we'll finish this up. I'm going to stop the recording. Is 123 chapter 8, okay?